welcome to the ProcureTech podcast, bringing insight and inspiration into how digital technology is shaping our profession. I'm your host, James Meads, tea drinker, expat, and <laughs> definitely not your typical consultant. Yes, hello, greetings wherever you are and welcome to another edition of the ProcureTech podcast where every week we bring you news, stories and insights into everything digital procurement from service providers to thought leaders right the way through to actual case studies of successful transformations. And on today's show, we're going to be talking all about spend analytics. And for anyone that follows me on LinkedIn, one of the things you'll know is I'm all about understanding your spend. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to today's guest. He is Sriram Vanita Krishnan from the company Symphony. And Symphony has developed a tool that uses AI to leverage smart spend analytics. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation today because I think I'm going to learn a lot more about what this tool can do and how some of the sort of insights into the future of how we may do strategic sourcing and how some of what was traditionally seen as being sort of the more strategic end of the spectrum in terms of sourcing skills may be able to leverage AI going forward to make our tasks easier. So Sriram, welcome to the podcast. First of all, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and what Symphony does, and then we'll jump straight in. Right, James, thank you so much uh, for having me. So Symphony, uh, my company, uh, has got two main products. We, we are becoming a technology company. So two main products, one is Spend Analytics, which everybody knows. The second one is something different that we are doing. Uh, it's called Spend Automation. We have a bunch of different solutions coming together on the Spend Automation t- uh, side, primarily focusing on mid-market and large companies, helping them with their tail spend, indirect spend, that sort of categories. Uh, automating how they purchase those categories and stuff. Great. Okay. So one of the reasons I was keen to get Symphony to come on the show is because a lot of what the tool claims to do is what we've been accustomed to seeing as being sort of key procurement skills for strategic sourcing and category management professionals. Whereas a lot of other software that, that's out there tends to, to facilitate the process more for transactional and operational buying and to automate or make that less administrative. So in essence, what you do is a spend management tool, but the signature line on your website is AI-powered spend intelligence. And I wanted to dive into that a little bit because that's that's a really interesting concept. So maybe you can explain to anyone that doesn't really understand it, the capabilities of, of AI and, and what that can do in the spend management space. Sure. So the, the AI, which we talk about in our website is primarily on spend analytics that you would see, we, we have some element of uh, automation and AI capabilities and spend automation side of business, but the major application that we have is on analytics. So when you talk about AI, t- typically AI is a larger umbrella of this intelligence. And then under that you have ML and, and different other areas. So you know, if, if you take AI is fundamental for anybody kind of layman to understand, if the, the basic is that AI helps us predict an outcome based on certain parameters, right? So the typical application of, let's say, computer vision, converting an image into some sort of vectors and numbers, and then predicting whether that is a cat or a dog or an apple or an orange. So that, that, that is an AI capability, which allows us to read the image using computer vision and convert. Similarly, in our context, we are, we are dealing with text data especially when, when it comes to classification and normalization of suppliers in analytics, we, we take the data and try and convert that into input parameters, which then can predict some sort of outcome like categories or supply group names, clearing out the supplier similar differences, that sort of stuff. So, and we use a number of open source and libraries that can allow us to do convert these into input parameters, take on the description, convert this into input parameters and then uh, understand what sort of categories you should fall under. One example is how do we take a description, which is called a document, 
in the data science world. So how do you take one document, which is a description, and then understand what is relevant in that description, which we can use for classification, or which can be used to predict a classification or a category. So for example, if somebody says purchase of laptop bags, then we have laptop, which, which could be an item. Laptop bag is a different item. It's an accessory versus a laptop. So how do you kind of use AI or natural language processing to understand this text and the context and then put it in the, under the right category? So that, that, that is one way of using it. And then from an AI context or perspective, there are various different applications. In, from our perspective, from a spend analytics perspective, that is one way of using it. So I've spoken about this at length before in terms of poor quality of data can often be a reason why digital transformations can, can fail or not be as successful as, as they're anticipated to be. And I, I see that one, one of the things that you just explained there is a little bit around data classification and taxonomy. And, and I know an accusation that tends to get thrown around and I sort of maintain a neutral view on this as, as a podcast host, but it, it, it's that data classification still requires a human touch because AI isn't smart enough to identify certain anomalies yet. So are we there yet in terms of AI and machine learning being able to accurately classify PO data into different material groups? Or, or do you still think that while a tool like Symfony is very useful and can speed up the process that we still need sort of a hybrid approach and someone with 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 with, with human cognitive capabilities to do a sanity check and fine tune the analysis at the end yeah, i think that's a great question so a ai is no magic bullet or magic wand it's not gonna kind of solve all the problem and it, it only acts as the accelerator to be honest so g given we are given let's say a one million set of data uh, records how quickly we can just doing it manually versus how we quickly we can do using some sort of automation. So in, in our case, we not only just rely on this parsing of nouns and uh, key value pairs, we also rely on rules engine. So any, anything that we kind of classify using this automation, we capture into our master rules repository and this master rules repository gets reapplied to the new data. And again, even with that, it's never 100%. You definitely need some manual effort. So if you, if you can get like good percentage covered, 60%, 70% automated through this AI process, and then somebody will have to sanity check and approve them, which gets converted into rules, still there is about 20%, which then requires uh, somebody to manually classify them. That's the nature of the data. As you said, if the data is so complex, so contextually different from one customer to another customer, even within one business unit to another business unit, they call the same product in different names. It's just not going to be, uh, we are just not going to be able to kind of automate completely. So we, we have inbuilt tools within the system, which allows us to do this automation plus manual uh, kind of classification within the tool itself. So we have created an Excel sort of interface, which can allow us to quickly classify and capture all the rules. The fundamental is AI is expensive solution for all the problems. So we try and kind of capture all those rules. So the next time data comes, we can use the rules first, which is a much quicker, faster, cheaper solution to apply. So it's, it's definitely hybrid. And I think 100% automation can only happen if the organizations can keep their data very clean, which is a huge challenge. Yeah, and I think you, you alluded to it at the very beginning of that answer that, that there is no silver bullet, but I guess the advantage is that it can take a lot of manual work out for the sort of 60, 70% that it's able to classify. And then that makes the task for the data scientist or the data or data analyst, I guess, much, much simpler than if they have to then go and do a manual classification and and then organize everything into a final taxonomy. So just a quick interlude before we move on with the rest of the podcast, just to say that if you are a procurement leader or a finance leader in a manufacturing company and you're struggling to get to grips with your spend or you just maybe need an extra pair of hands to resolve a specific issue and drive some bottom line results, just drop me a connection request on LinkedIn or just ping me an email to info at jamesmeadsconsulting.com com or just follow the link in the show notes to book a free 30 minute initial call with me so as I can learn more about your business and what I can do to help you.
So now let's jump right back into the interview. Another thing that Symphony claims to do is is around risk management, because especially this now is going to be big business as we start to see the landscape emerge post COVID-19. To what extent can a machine or, or artificial intelligence project potential risk in your supply chain? And how does it go about analyzing that data? Does it do it from existing vendor records and supply patterns or does it or, or does it look on the marketplace and look at things like you know geopolitical risk and and civil unrest and that type of thing yeah again it's not an automation as such it's it's more of acceleration of decision making isn't it so we unearth kind of news articles unearth information which is not otherwise readily available for the category managers or sourcing managers right in front of them so great examples are supplier, commodity, and market news. So within each of these different categories, we have got sources and integrations with third-party providers and other news sources through which we bring in news articles and published articles, which will provide the category and sourcing managers some sort of insight with which they can take action. So we, we kind of address or try and give our customers top 20, top 50 suppliers, uh, news on a daily basis, which is automated, but decision has to be done manually and some the category managers will have to read them, what interests them and so on and so forth. So it's not an AI capability, but it's, it's more of providing them that insight or information readily available for them to take decisions. Right. Okay. So similar to what we said around the data classification, it's it's a tool that gives the knowledge to make it available to the to the procurement category manager but it's not something that does the work for them they're still going to have to have sort of a human thought process and analysis to be able to to make that call it just puts all of that information and data that they need to be able to make an informed decision all in one place and as such it saves a lot of time and increases the awareness of the different factors that they should be considering when making that decision yeah and uh, so great example is covid is happening happen and happening we, we brought in some third-party data sources. We converted them into some sort of scoring. For example, which country is locked down? What sort of factory activities are there? What sort of policies they are putting in place? We brought in a bunch of key markets, key scores or key parameters and scored them and kind of mapped that numbers against the suppliers and suppliers spent for our customers. So then the customers will have to then look at, hey, Symphony's analytics tells me that these 10 suppliers in these regions are at risk what do I do with it? Then they can reach out to the suppliers and clarify if they're still going to meet their delivery deadlines. Is there any kind of factory shutdowns, so on and so forth. So it's about giving them a direction in terms of where there are risks and then they can validate it from that. Much more easier. Yeah, giving them the tools to ask the right questions, right? So we've, we've, we've talked about data classification and taxonomy. We've talked about risk management in terms of sort of securing our supply chain. Let's get now to a topic that's you know usually at the sharp end of what buyers are, are tasked to do and what we're typically measured on, which is cost savings and expense reduction. How can AI and machine learning assist procurement departments in terms of being able to find the right cost or, or, the, or the most lucrative cost savings opportunities from the spend analytics that Symphony can provide? Yeah, this, this is more so of, of an automation of higher quality software than an AI capability, but it's still very powerful because end of the day, having done all the analytics, all the customers wants to know is where they can reduce cost. So one, one of the things we do or one of the modules that we offer our customers is opportunity assessment module. There's a standalone dedicated module on that. In, in that module, customers are given a bunch of opportunities which is like almost uh, kind of prescriptive saying, hey, these are the categories, these are the opportunities that you guys uh, can potentially work on and reduce cost. And and these opportunities are calculated using a bunch of calculations and automation. So we, we look at about 15 different parameters or 15 different savings levers. Each of them has got its own way of analysis which otherwise takes a lot of time for manual calculation. It is still possible, very much possible for somebody to sit down and do it manually, but doing it over a period of three, four weeks and over a period of three, three, four days, and then allowing our customers to validate in an interface much easily than through a PowerPoint or Excel is what we try to do. 
uh, and then the customers can turn those into projects and work on them. That's about 15 different opportunity levers or savings levers that we run through the data. Things like usual suspects like supply consolidation, price variance, payment term rationalizations, all, all those sort of things, every different angles from which they can reduce cost. And this is then kind of given back to the customer. Does it also feed into things like commodity pricing for, for certain raw materials as well? Can it, can it benchmark indices and look at where maybe you're paying way above what the market price should be? Yeah, we, we call it should cost analysis. Uh, one of the recent addition in that 15 is this should cost analysis. So we connect to two different data sources for this. One is a data source which provide us the cost drivers for certain kind of products or uh, industry. So for example, uh, I buy a lot of plastic, plastic-based items, and I can then figure out, okay, where am I buying from? And for that industry, how does the cost look like? How does the EBITDA look like? How does the sales and marketing cost look like? And we uh, kind of uh, tap into a data source which provides us this directional cost breakdown. So it, it tells us this is the cost, this is the spend I have on this plastic product, and this is how the industry cost driver look like. And then we also connect to commodity sources for plastic in that market or other commodities in particular markets, which then allows our customers to kind of create a simulation in terms of, hey, can I reduce by a supplier or sales and marketing by 3%, what sort of profit I can or savings I can make, how the commodity market has performed versus my unit price, is there anything I can leverage, then kind of it makes for a very powerful negotiation tool for our customers. So that's, that's one thing which we do. And, and that's typically one thing that if you were to ask a bunch of different buyers, you know, why do you fail or why don't you get the optimum outcome from your negotiation? I think probably a majority of them would say just lack of time to pre- prepare and lack of availability of the of the necessary resources to go out and pull that information. A lot of companies have cut back budgets. So, you know, things like market price analysis, they may have canceled subscriptions, which I personally think is a stupid decision, but big companies do make these very barbarian decisions to cut expenses left, right and center. And I think the other point on this is, and you, you hinted to it in your answer, that even though it may be possible to do this type of analysis manually, in a lot of companies, especially in larger corporations, what you often find is that there is a lot of rotation between different positions. You know, some companies have a policy of, of of moving people around every three or four years, especially in sort of more senior roles. And if you've got all of this information and data at your fingertips, then if you move into a new procurement category manager position in a category that you've not managed before, Whereas in the past, it may have taken you sort of six to 12 months to really sort of know what you're doing and be able to make an impact. You know, the demands of the business as such these days are that you need to be able to hit the ground running. And I guess this helps you to get a much faster induction into something that you're not familiar with. So, you know, the core procurement skills go with you from category to category, but having that market intelligence and understanding of of your spend, your suppliers, your risks uh, and the marketplace is is really valuable to get that quickly all in one place. So, totally. I think for me, negotiations are at two levels. So typically there is a fact-based negotiation we can look at how do we reduce supplier? How do we look at payment term and reduce the number of payment terms with which we pay, et cetera. And the second level of negotiation is the optimization sort of negotiation. So look at the category itself and see beyond these pure cost-based negotiation, what else can we do? So for that, this is very powerful in terms of providing them the cost drivers and stuff. Just to add on to that, it's a very important point in terms of kind of maintaining knowledge is that in opportunity assessment, when we provide the customers with categories and where they can attack and stuff, we also give our customers in terms of what sort of kind of negotiation levers they have within each category. So so certain categories have got certain negotiation levers and it differs from different product to product or categories to categories. So we try and provide that intelligence too. So we have been building and it grows over a period of time, a library of negotiation levers by category, which then the customers can use. So even if somebody do not have a lot of background, let's say, on IT network equipment. They can, they can have some input from us, not everything, but some input from our technology or platform, which they can kind of build on. 
With all of these different things that, that a tool like Symphony can do and with the procurement landscape changing and, you know, you hear a lot on LinkedIn and in the procurement and supply chain press around more focus being on total value rather than just a, a rather cutthroat approach to price negotiations. And I definitely buy into and agree with all of that, although I do think Obviously, we're still going to be measured on savings for a long while to come. So maybe if I can ask you a little bit of a philosophical question as we start to round up. Out of these three sort of key pillars that that Symphony offers to its clients, or perhaps you can maybe even think of something else, what do you think will have the most profound impact on procurement performance and strategy over the next sort of five years? These are essential components. These are not the only way of doing it. These are essential components of doing a complete or holistic analysis per se. But there is procurement organizations have got different maturity and organizations with different maturity can pick different solutions. So I I look at an analytics platform for procurement in four different kind of hierarchy. The, The fundamental or the base that everybody should have should be the minimum capability of data management and dashboards. So everybody should have visibility, ability to manage their own data, get the data that they want when they want, all those sort of stuff. And once they have it, the next level is to kind of put in intelligence in terms of AI or predictive uh, algorithms. So we also do predictive modeling, which tells us when you can expect to buy an item in the next six months, that sort of thing, which again, accelerates the speed at which procurement can perform. And if they have it, then if they, they are a little bit more matured organization, then there is definitely much more things they can do around going deep dive analytics around categories, opportunity assessment, procurement operation, cycle time, that sort of thing. For the top, let's say global big companies, if, if they have great maturity and they've got nailed the other three, then they should try and leverage network opportunity when i say network it's about bringing in third-party data sources using collective intelligence of the platform like benchmarks so on and so forth so i see this in a kind of three four different hierarchy in terms of the leveraging analytics itself and in terms of where the current maturity of the organization stand they should be able to kind of go with that but at the at the bare minimum everybody should have a great data management dashboard capability or dashboard tool for them to have the visibility. And I completely agree with you. You can't run before you can walk. And if you don't even have that basic in place, then there's no point trying to do something at the very high end with AI because you've not got the fundamentals in place. So that's a it's a really interesting answer that you gave. Thank you for that. It's highly dependent on organizational maturity and, and data quality in terms of how quickly you can get up to speed and leverage some of these technologies. And I think that's going to be even more important as time goes on to have you know, these type of things in place. Finally, Sriram, if anybody would like to book a demo or connect with you, what's the best place that they can get in touch? Please, uh, I welcome to go onto a website, put in an email address and our team will get back. Otherwise, you can reach out to me and I can arrange for something. It's uh, www.symphony.com. Symphony spelled as S-I-M-F-O-N-I.com. Fantastic. Okay, Sriram, it's been a great discussion with you. I've certainly learned a lot about how while AI can be a real game changer, you still definitely need to have the human touch and the human expertise in place. And then both man and machine together are a pretty awesome combination. So if there's one lesson to take away from this interview, I would definitely say that is the key. Thanks again for joining me, Sri Ram. It was great talking to you and look after yourself. Keep in touch and yeah, all the best. No, th- thank you so much for having me. I think uh, these discussions are great. We-, we learn quite a bit and thank you again and look forward to catching up uh, sometime later. So I don't know about you, but if you're a regular listener, then maybe you've seen a similar pattern emerge as I have as the host with each week that goes by that I interview the fantastic guests that I'm able to get onto the show. And that is that some of these topics just keep coming up and keep repeating themselves. And I don't think that's a coincidence, right? I mean, things like data quality, 
organizational maturity and if you're going to leverage the power of some of these digital tools and technological developments then you have to have the right team in place to enable both the human touch and the machine capability to be able to have their most impactful effect so until next week thanks again for listening all the best and i will chat to you again soon cheers and bye for now Thanks again for listening to this episode of the ProcureTech podcast. If you like the show, then please subscribe or even better, why not write us a quick review on Apple Podcasts? It would not only really make my day, but it would also help our mission to enable procurement and finance leaders to become more data-driven through the power of digital transformation.